Um, thank you, Nigel. Turning to your book, uh, it's and, and I would like at another time to look at the kingdom. Um, uh, that's chapter thirty-one and thirty-two. But today, do you mind if we look at chapter thirty-three, paragraph three? Paragraph three. Yeah, just give me a second. I'll just. That's the paragraph I I texted you about on page one hundred and thirty-seven. Um, yeah, that's all. Cause kingdom accomplished after the wicked are destroyed. Is that the one? That's it. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Maybe on some other occasion we could look at the kingdom. Um, 1914, which is mentioned in chapters 31 and especially, well, 30, 32, really. The word, the, the, the date 1919 is not mentioned very strangely. And yet that's central because that's when you claim that um, Jesus cleansed and chose the Watchtower Society. I think that that should also be a part of the discussion or discussion for another time. Um, I'm... I've been what's called a millennial for some time, um, but over the last month or so, looking at the kingdom, I'm vehemently now vehemently convinced that what's called the a millennial position is true. Um, I don't like the word a millennial because it means no millennium. It really is a form of post millennialism. About a hundred years ago, it was simply called post millennialism. Yeah. There's there's okay. two theories. Christ comes back before the millennium, pre-millennialism. Christ comes back after the millennium, post-millennialism. But within okay. those two positions, there's two variations of that. Um, so Spurgeon was a classical pre-millennialist. He believed Christ came back before the millennium. But that position is tiny now. What you have is American evangelicals who believe in the rapture. There's multiple peoples of God. There's multiple revelation. There's multiple resurrections. There's multiple destinations. So they teach that the Jews live on the earth eternally, but the church is raptured to heaven eternally, and never the twain shall meet. And the event that separates the two is called the rapture. Okay. Um, I think Judge Rutherford borrowed from that belief when he saw Jehovah's Witnesses were going to exceed 144,000. The other view is post-millennialism there's going to be a millennium okay which is the rule of christ and there's two views on that jonathan edwards taught the millennium is going to be on the earth and other post-millennialists thought the the gospel will be so successful the whole world will become christian and that you know they'll pull down the mosque in mecca and there'll be a church in mecca the whole world will just become christianized as the gospel goes throughout the world and everyone becomes a Christian. That's post-millennialism. There's another type of post-millennialism, which is called amillennial, which I would hold to. And that is that basically, um, yes, post-millennium, Christ comes after the millennium, but the millennium is in heaven. It's a heavenly millennium. It's not here on earth. I, I'd have no objection to amillennialists saying that Christ rules in the hearts of his people here on earth. But the key thing is the millennium is in heaven. So I've been spending hour after hour after hour looking at this um, for the last month or so. Um, and maybe for some other time we could we could look at that because it's truly fascinating. I haven't dotted every I. I haven't crossed every T. I could well have some certain things wrong. But you kind of learn by talking to people, you see. Sure. sure. So just to be clear, then, just so I, I again, I understand what you mean by it being a heavenly millennium. Are you saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, so Christ is ruling from the heavens, obviously, I accept that, um, and then all of the, all of the, his subjects, all of the people that benefit from Christ's ransom sacrifice eventually would be in heaven alongside him, and no. that's where... No, no. Okay. Uh, absolutely not. They shall, no. reign upon, okay. they shall reign upon the earth, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. It's 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 only one view which splits believers into two groups. And that's the uh, dispensational premillennial view held by American evangelicals, OK, which is spread throughout the whole world because the Americans have got all the money, all the TV stations, all the satellites, all the power. And that's the view that the Jews will live on the earth eternally. And there's a different people. Of... Jews. Yes. 
Yes, they, they teach that the literal Jews will have all the promises, all the covenants fulfilled. So the Jews will reign on the earth. There'll be a temple in Jerusalem and the Jews are going to reign on the earth and go to that temple and offer sacrifices in the temple. OK, for all eternity, not just in the millennium. But the church has a different covenant with God. So they're also resurrected because dispensationalists believe in multiple resurrections and multiple covenants and multiple peoples of God. Where are you going to put them? Well, you can't put them on the earth because the Jews are on the earth. So they're sent to heaven. And the event that sends them to heaven is the rapture. Okay. That, that, that's something you do need to understand very well because it's the, it's the dominant view. Um, it's the dominant view today outside of Roman, Roman, Roman Catholicism. It's, it's, it's the dominant view today. Yes, I mean, funny enough, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to think about, the, you know, the, the number of years that I've been out on our door-to-door -door ministry. I've never, I've actually never heard that, but I, I funny enough, but I, I do need to uh, look into that. And I haven't understood that to be the view, in this country at least, that, that many people have expressed, but yeah. Well, in this country, the only people who officially hold to the dispensational premillennial view are the brethren. Uh, the brethren are a tiny, tiny, tiny group. They're, they're so small, they're in, they are insignificant, right? But this belief, dispensationalism, um, started by John Nelson Darby in the Victorian age and then promoted over 100 years ago by Cyrus Ingersoll Schofield, who was a Freemason, and almost certainly had the backing of his brother Freemasons and especially Jewish Freemasons because it's behind it's behind the Christian Zionist movement today. Um, it, it's so infected American evangelicalism 100 years ago. It has declined slightly over the last 50 years. And also, thank goodness, it's moderated. So you now have different types of dispensational theology. And to be fair to them, one or two of its more moderate forms, I would say, is heterodox, not heresy. Because classical dispensationalism teaches under um, Darby and Schofield that people are saved in different ways in different dispensations. So during... So... A thousand years ago, sorry, um, so two, two and a half thousand years ago, people were saved by keeping the law. Yeah. Right. Not by grace. By, by law keeping. Then Jesus came along during the church age. People are now saved by grace. During the millennium, yeah. people are going to be back under law keeping again. Now, that's that's heresy. That's blasphemy and that's heresy. But thank goodness more moderate dispensationalism has come along and is also an American evangelicalism, um, progressive dispensationalism, which say, no, no, people are saved the same way by grace, through faith alone, by trusting in Christ in every dispensation, to which I would say amen. Um, but it's very confusing and it's very complicated. It's got lots of this. It's, it's like an octopus with a thousand tentacles. You can speak to one dispensationalist and he would have a different view to another one. Part of the problem yeah. is many of the people, many of the pastors don't understand it. They just teach it. They teach it as yeah. orthodoxy without understanding it. Yes, and, and it's come into Europe and it's all over the world through the Pentecostal charismatic movement, through American evangelicalism. So yeah. you, you get it in Baptist type churches sometimes, not always. But it, it really come back in through charismatics and Pentecostals. If you speak to a charismatic and Pentecostal pastor about dispensationalism, they won't know what you're talking about. They just teach it. <laughs> so so, so how, so how do you feel about the, you know, the, so go, going back to the brochure and our view that, you know, we've got this idea of 144,000 ruling alongside Jesus Christ in heaven um, for a thousand years. Uh, after which the earth will be and people on the earth will be brought to uh, perfection um, at the end of that that period. That's the, the goal that Jesus and the 144,000 would have. And then we've got this idea then of, of people living forever on a paradise earth. Um, all, all as a complete result, of course, as you were saying, uh, as a result of the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ and putting exercising faith in that. Um, and, you know, that being the sort of very broad brush view of 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 the Jehovah's Witnesses, how do you feel about that as a, as a 
well, have an idea or concept. Where, where's your, where's your, your, the gaps, if you like, in, in your thinking? Or, well, in, in, today, let's, let's, today, let's look at chapter 33, paragraph 3, and let's leave this for another yeah. time. But I am totally convinced that Judge Rutherford brought in the two classes of believer in 1935, when the Jehovah's Witnesses' worldwide membership was going to exceed 144,000. And I think he got this from American evangelicalism. He got it from dispensational theology, because Jehovah's Witnesses are based in America. Rutherford was living in America. The number one group he would have come up against as they knocked on doors with their gramophones and played the gramophone records to people in the 1930s weren't the Catholics, weren't the liberals, it was American evangelicals who taught dispensationalism as orthodoxy, namely that you have two classes of believer, one class goes to heaven, that's the church, the other class lives on the earth, that's the Jews. And the rapture is the event that separates the two and never the twain shall meet. So you have multiple resurrections, multiple peoples of God with multiple covenants and multiple destinations. There's only two groups in church history that have taught that, dispensationalism and Jehovah's Witnesses. So I think Jehovah's Witnesses have been influenced by that. But I'm letting you know about this because maybe we could talk about this on another time. Yes, I mean, I'd, I'd like to do some... You can do some preparation, some yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the idea, just again, just to, you know, just very keen to get yeah. your, an understanding of, of your view. So the, the idea of 144,000 co-rulers in heaven, for example, is, is not something that you recognise as being, um, you know, a scripturally sound point. Is that true? Um, I, I would see the earth as being the ultimate destination for Christian people. Yeah. And I believe God has one Christian people. He doesn't have multiple yeah. peoples with multiple covenants. So whether yeah. it says 144,000 or the anointed or the great crowd or the little flock, it's referring to the same people. I'd see heaven. Heaven is, is known in Christian theology as the intermediate state. So it's a temporary state for people when they die their souls or spirits go to heaven. Now, I know you don't believe that. You believe yeah. that people cease to exist when they die. I believe that people, as their soul or spirit, goes to heaven as a temporary state known as the intermediate state. At Christ's second coming, he comes back with these souls or spirits. It's pictured figuratively as riding on white horses. White horse means uh, horse is quick. Right. So that's why it's a horse and it's white, because it represents purity. You know, children being 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 innocent are usually um, if you have a child's funeral, the, the coffin is is white to symbolize the innocence of the ch innocence of the child. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. What are those washed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it would be for another time. And I'm letting you know this because I think that it's pointless to discuss it unless you actually prepare. And I also prepare. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I would see one people of God. I see different, for instance, Jesus is called Jesus in the Bible. He's called the Christ. He's called the son of David. He's called the son of man. He's called the branch. Yeah. He's called the son of David. He's called the son of God. Well, does that mean there are six different Jesuses? Because there's six different yeah. titles there. No, it's the same person, but with different titles. And likewise, yeah, sure. God's people could be referred to as the 144,000, which is simply the, the number 12 and the number 10 cubed and squared. And it's the number of perfection and completion cubed and squared. Um, but yeah, yeah I, 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 I've yeah, really been at this. Yeah. I've really been at this for hour after hour. And I'm, I'm totally convinced. Um, I have been for, for several years, but over the last month, looking at the kingdom, I'm totally convinced that, um, yeah, the, the, the kingdom rule of Christ at the present time is in heaven. Yes, I mean, we, so we're... we're you know, we're convinced about the kingdom rule of Christ ruling from heaven, obviously. I mean, that's something that, that we, we would uh, uh, echo. So uh, I think what you're saying, though, just again, just to, again, it's just useful because we can let me have another yeah. discussion. We can, we can sort of do a bit of research on this. But So I think you were saying that, that when people die, they go to heaven, their souls go to heaven. And then when Jesus returns, you were saying, I didn't quite understand what you were saying after that about those souls that are in heaven. Are they then reincarnated in a no there's 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 earth? there's no reincarnation in the bible um hebrews nine twenty seven it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment so I don't believe in reincarnation 
the souls that are with Christ reigning with Christ in heaven. And, and it clearly says in Revelation 20 verse 4 that they are reigning with Christ in heaven. Yeah. And, and that's the millennium chapter. And that's the place of the, of the millennium in heaven. Yeah. They come back with Christ at the second coming. Their bodies are resurrected and they are reunited with their now glorified resurrected human bodies to reign okay. upon the earth with Christ. You believe in a resurrection, so we we accept that, obviously, yep. and we believe in that. Um, and then, so in other words, and then essentially, so basically, uh, you know, everybody that that, that, that is, has this soul that's in heaven with Christ at the moment, they'll essentially be resurrected physically here on earth. You, I think you're saying that Christ comes back physically here to the earth as well. Is that what you're also saying? Yes, yes. The the second yeah. coming of Christ is a literal bodily physical return to this earth of Jesus Christ but yeah. he comes back with his saints who 1 John 3 yeah. 2 says will be like him for that they they will they will see him as he is and they will be like him in other words they will have glorified human bodies Christ is the first fruits to rise in his glorified human body um, the righteous dead will be given a glorified human body the rest of the dead will be resurrected in their bodies but will face punishment in those bodies. Okay, so there'll be resurrection. There'll be a judgment. Or a judgment. Yes. Yeah. What's your view of Armageddon? Um, well, I believe it happens. It happens um, just before the second coming of Christ. Ar Ar Armageddon sort of is is terminated by the second coming of Christ. So Armageddon ends. The the beast and the false prophet, their rule um, ends with Christ's return to this earth at the, at the second coming. And it, then the, the great crowd is described in Revelation. Um, well, well, the great crowd is actually in, the great crowd in Revelation 9, 9, 1 is in heaven. John said, behold, I looked and I saw, quote, a great crowd in heaven. And I think your Bible reads uh, a great crowd in heaven in Revelation 19, verse 1. Well, well, could could we could, could could we actually leave that for another time? I'm, I'm letting you know what yeah, I'm yeah. looking at. Could we actually read chapter thirty-three, paragraph three? There's three questions that I've got in this paragraph, and could we leave the rest for another time? I mean, are you happy with that, Nigel? I've given yeah, you sure. really detailed explanation of where I'm going, what I'm thinking. I'm admitting to you, um, I cannot. You know, I'm I'm just an ordinary guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not a professor of systematic theology. I don't speak Greek or Hebrew. I did, I did start both when I went to university, and I wasn't clever enough to get the university credits. I did quite a lot of Greek. I did about twelve yeah. weeks of Greek, but I, I wasn't gonna. It, Wenham is very, very complicated, and I, I basically gave up after about. Perhaps it was ten weeks. Perhaps it was ten weeks I gave up rather than twelve. It's yeah. sometime around there. I think it was chapter 10 that I sort of hoisted up the white flag. Um, but I'm just an ordinary guy. Shall we actually read that paragraph? Because I, I must insist that we sort of tag what we're doing today to your book. Do you want to read it? I can read it. So after the wicked are destroyed, Jesus will rule as king for a thousand years. During that time, he and his 144,000 co-rulers will help humans on earth to become perfect and sinless. By the end of that period, the earth will be turned into a beautiful paradise filled with happy people who benefit from obeying Jehovah's laws. Jesus will then hand the rulership back to his father, Jehovah, as never before, Jehovah's name will be sanctified. It will have been proved that Jehovah is a good ruler who cares about his subjects. Jehovah will then destroy Satan and the demons and any others who choose to rebel against his rulership. The perfect conditions brought about by God's kingdom will last forever. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Now, in the third line from the bottom, it says Jehovah will then destroy Satan, the demons and any others who choose to rebel against his rulership. It says Jehovah will then destroy Satan. And the verse given is Revelation 27 to 10. Well, um, I've got Revelation 20 verse 10 here. And it seems to say the opposite of that. I once bought a three volume Christadelphian commentary on the book of Revelation simply because I wanted to know what the leader of the Christadelphians taught on Revelation 20 verse 10. And it was it was about 2000 pages um, in my last flat move, um, the move before I've just made, I I had to get rid of some books and I didn't want to donate that to charity shop with all the other hundreds of books I was donating. So it went in the bin. But funnily enough, the whole 2000 page commentary on Revelation, he made copious notes on every verse of the book of Revelation. But when he came to verse 10, he had nothing to say about it. <laughs> and it says this, and the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night is given for emphasis. It's continual torment. Forever is actually in the plural. So it's forevers. And it's and it's uh, repeated again for even more emphasis. So it actually says forevers and forevers. And um, you can't torment day and night forevers and forevers someone who is destroyed, who doesn't, who no longer exists. If you say the word tormented means to restrain or to imprison, again, you cannot restrain or imprison day and night forever and ever somebody who no longer exists because they've been destroyed. So you're saying, so basically, yeah, so basically we're saying that, I mean, the devil who was in Sweden was held in the lake of fire. So our um, view is the lake of fire is, represents everlasting destruction. You know, what's what? fire does yeah it destroys something um and the false prophet and the wild beast were also in that lake of fire and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever so your view would be that they're in some kind of hell is that how you view that verse um the word is tormented yeah right. now some people and i believe that your um i looked on your study edition on jw.org it says the word tormented can mean to restrain or to imprison. The point I'm making is that however you interpret that word tormented, whether it means to actually physically torment or to restrain or to imprison, you cannot torment, restrain or imprison somebody who doesn't exist. You can only restrain, torment or imprison somebody who is extant, who is existing. And that torment is day and night, forevers and forevers. So it's a continual, never-ending torment or restraining or imprisoning. Yes. Um, I'm just going to look. Because your, your, your book says, Jehovah will then destroy Satan, the demons, and any others who choose to rebel against his rulership. Revelation 27, verse 10. 7 to, 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 to 10. But when you read verse 10, and the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. H how, how does your Bible read, Nigel? Is that the new world translation you've got? Yes. In verse 10, you're saying? Yes. Yes. It, well, it reads, I've just read, I think, and the devil who was misleading them was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur where both the wild beast and the false prophet already were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever so it says the same sort of line, line that you just said yeah. but <laughs> how can you torment someone who doesn't exist yeah i mean i guess it's a figurative expression i guess um but what's it a figurative so i guess if you look at verse 14 it talks about the death and the grave yeah. were hurled into the lake of fire this means the second death, the lake of fire. Well, fire in the Bible is representative or figurative of God's God's anger and his judgment against sin and sinners. Yes, yes. and destruction. I mean, the, 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 the result of sin is death, isn't it? The consequences of sin. But you, but you cannot destroy a, a spiritual being like the devil in a physical fire. Something physical 
cannot destroy something that is spiritual like the devil. Yeah, sure, that's why it's figurative. Obviously, the devil is a spirit creature. Yeah. Um, so it's not, it's not a literal lake of fire, is it? No, it no, no, no. It's, 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 it's representative of God's eternal judgment, just like the book of life. Correct. In, in is is figurative of God's <laughs> omniscient, His knowing who are His, and who are you know who are actually the saved. Uh, the Book yeah. of Life is not a book that's a quarter of a mile thick in heaven. I've seen it pictured that way in in a chick chick in a chick track. You've got this angel with wings, and he's opening this very thick book, and he's looking for people's names in the book. Well, the Book of Life just represents God's omniscience, His knowing all things, and therefore His knowing who are His. The, the lake of fire and brimstone is a because you see the the Bible's written for people who haven't got any scientific knowledge. A lot of what we know now, um, the world of the spirit, right, which the Bible calls spirit, would simply be dimensions more than our four dimensions. Physicists have said the world possibly exists in ten or eleven dimensions. So there's yeah, lots of so, so people, there's lots of simplification in the Bible. Well, he's going to be he's going to be under punishment. He will be restrained or imprisoned and there will be to some degree. I don't know how tormented day and night forever and ever. He will be restrained in prison. So he'll be existing in an imprisoned and a restrained state, um, experiencing some sort of suffering, which is listed here as tormented. I don't believe the flames are literal. I believe it's a figurative representation. But he's going to exist forever and ever in a state of suffering. But your book says the opposite. It says Jehovah will then destroy Satan. Well, if Satan's destroyed, yeah. he can't be suffering forever. No, but I, mean, I think the, again, I think thinking about that figurative language, I think it, for us it, it makes sense that ultimately once Jehovah has, made the case against Satan, and obviously that's a bigger subject, yeah. then to keep Satan uh, suffering for eternity in some way, tormented in whatever way that might be, doesn't seem compatible with this concept of, A, you know, the, the, the wages of sin pays his death, I and mean, that's what happens to humans. Um, ultimately, they don't suffer in hell or in any shape or form. So to have Satan tormented forever um, just doesn't seem compatible with what Jehovah is capable of doing. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just destroy Satan? Satan's off the scene. The, the point has been proven about Satan's um, inability. Um, uh, well, I think... I mean, the fact, that he's, the fact that he's tormented may, it may refer, for example, to the fact that he's, um, he's dead. You know, that, that in itself would be a torment, wouldn't it? The same no, 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 no. People... Is. People who cease to, if you believe that death is ceasing to exist, then he, you see, you have to allow Jehovah to speak to for himself. You might not like what Jehovah says, but Jehovah has the right to say what he wants to say. And in Revelation 20, verse 10, Jehovah is saying that the devil, the beast and the false prophet are going to be tormented. That could mean imprisoned. OK, your your um, your New World Translation study edition, which I looked at on JW.org, it says imprisoned or restrained. So wh however that word means, and it, it's a very long, I've got it written down in my wide margin Bible. It's 928 in Strong's Concordance. Tormented is bass. And this was probably written 20 years ago with a pink pen. It's hard to make it out. It's a very long Greek word. It begins bass. And it ends with uh, alpha uh, alpha iota, so that's a diphthong. So it'll it'll finish with an e pronunciation. T e would be how it would um, be pronounced. And I wouldn't even begin to to try to do that. But it Jehovah says that Satan is going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. You even read that in your New World Translation. Now that's what Jehovah says. I don't care what people think and what they feel that Jehovah ought to do or Jehovah should do, or they feel, or they try and reason that Jehovah can't do this, or Jehovah can't do that, because it goes against their idea of, of morals and good and bad. Jehovah says that Satan is not going to be destroyed. He's going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
And I have not, I wouldn't have too much of an objection if you said tormented could really mean imprisoned or restrained. Perhaps it actually means all three. Yeah, Satan would be restrained. He'll be imprisoned in some sense. Uh, I don't believe he's going to be put into a roasted over flames. OK, I'm not suggesting that. But in some sense, tormented means he will experience some sort of suffering. Because you, because you see, after Christ's second coming, the glory of God is going to fill the universe. Now, now think about it. If you, I remember when I was a kid of about 11 or 12 at boarding school, some of the other kids, we tried to look at the sun. And of course, after about a second, it hurt our eyes and we turned away because looking at the sun directly hurts your eyes. Yes. Well, that's what it's going to be like throughout the whole universe. At Christ's second coming, the glory of God is going to fill the entire universe. Now, if there are creatures living in that universe who have not been destroyed. They're going to live on forever. Uh, probably in a kind of prison like place, you know, with nice thick stone walls. If the glory of God is going to fill the universe, then if these creatures have not been transformed into the likeness of Christ, as 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 God's elect have, because one John chapter three, verse two, the verse I was searching for, for we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right. So when he is revealed, that's Christ, we shall be like him, meaning we shall have glorified human bodies. We shall be free of sin, for we shall see him as he is. Well, if we're transformed into the likeness of Christ and made sinless through Christ's sacrifice, looking at the glory of God is going to be a wonderful thing for us. Because we've been transferred into the likeness of God. So to spend all eternity in God's, God's um, presence is going to be a wonderful thing. It will be like if I was transformed into a mini sun, looking at the sun at the centre of our solar system is going to be wonderful for me because I'm going to be of the same nature as the sun that I'm looking at. Yeah, it's perhaps not a very good example. But what about creatures that haven't been transformed into the likeness of God, like the devil, the beast and the false prophet? OK, who are going to du who, who are going to exist for all eternity in their sins? Well, if they haven't been transformed to the likeness of um, Jesus, if they are sinful creatures who have not been transformed into the likeness of Jesus, then if they're going to not be destroyed, if they're going to exist for all eternity in the presence with the glory of God filling the entire universe, it's going to be for them like being forced to look at the sun for all eternity. And I believe there there is going to be degrees of suffering and degrees of punishment. I would imagine that somebody who hasn't done too much of a sin, probably they'll be given a nice uh, deep cave or prison cell with nice thick rock and stone. And maybe the glory of God won't won't seep into that um, prison cell to any great extent. So they'll just be all on their own for all eternity. But there are other creatures like the devil Maybe the devil will be in a, a different prison cell where it won't, won't be made of stone. Maybe it'll be made of, made of um, you know, metal bars and he'll have to experience the glory of God for all eternity. Because that's what the suffering is. The suffering is not literal flames. This is used as an, as an analogy here. And also in Luke chapter 16, the account of the rich man and Lazarus, to, um, to express what it's going to be like for someone who is a sinner to exist for all eternity in the glory of God. At least that's the case here in Revelation 20, verse 10. It's a different, different case in Luke, Luke 16. But in both cases, there's a degree of suffering. And the flames well, that are used yeah, yeah. the flames that are used in both but the flames that are used in both cases represents God's holiness. The, yeah. the very nature of God will fill the universe. His holiness will fill the universe. God's not going to uh, change that just to please you. Yeah, or to or, or 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 to appease Jehovah's Witness theology, the glory of God is going to fill the universe. Now, you if if you were to exist in God's universe, and you have not been transformed transformed into the likeness of Christ, then you will suffer when you encounter the glory of God. Okay, which is which is pictured figuratively by flames. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Okay. Listen, from, 
I, I'm very happy to have another conversation. Let me do a little bit more thinking about what yeah. you said. Yeah. You said. Yeah, and sure. Then, um, let's let's see whether um, we can come back and just do a bit more digging well, around on some of these topics and um, pick up the conversation at yeah. the time. Would that be okay? Yes, I must insist we do one one thing at a time because these are very deep questions. I've got two more questions I could give them to you very briefly about paragraph three. Do you mind? Yes. Um, um, I did actually speak to another Jehovah's Witness elder uh, at another uh, Kingdom Hall some time ago. And um, I did say, could you please give me a reference in the Jehovah's Witness literature um, where the 144,000 co-rulers uh, in line two, where it says they're going to be raised as non-human spirit creatures. And I actually got a, a text message from him yesterday. He said, read chapter, um, read chapter 17 of one of your books. Um, I think Paradise Restored to Mankind by Theocracy or um, Revelation's Grand Climax at Hand. Well, that's telling me to read an entire chapter is a waste of my time. Um, <clears throat> it's important to be precise and accurate in life. Um is it true? So that, that, so the question you had is: Is it true that the hundred and forty? Is it true? Non, non, is it yeah. true that the hundred and forty-four thousand co-rulers, the little flock, are going to be raised as non-human spirit creatures? And if so, can yeah. you give me the reference in Jehovah's Witness literature which says that? And I'm specifically focusing on non-human. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Um, and is that true? It, you, you, you do teach the hundred and forty-four thousand are going to be resurrected as non-human. Yes. OK. Right. Well, where does it say non-human spirit creatures? Um, the, the final thing would be that same paragraph, which I'll read again, the th first three lines. After the wicked are destroyed, Jesus will rule as king for a thousand years. That's the millennium. OK. During that time, he, that's Jesus, and his 144,000 co-rulers will help humans on earth to become perfect and sinless. Now, it misses out the great crowd. I, I don't believe that people can be have a second chance of salvation. They're going to be resurrected and have a second chance of salvation because Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. But it misses out the great crowd. So what I think this sentence is saying is that in their priestly function, the 144,000 little flock, the anointed, in their priestly function, will be working with Jesus to make those humans resurrected to the earth sinless. Have I got that right? They will be, yes, they will be part of the administration that, that brings mankind, and not just mankind, but the earth back to the restored condition, correct? Well, the text says sinless. During that time, he and his 144,000 yeah. co-rulers will help humans on earth to become perfect and sinless. I yeah. believe that only Jesus can make people sinless. Mark 2.10 says that, but but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. So Mark 2.10 says Jesus forgives sins. Now, the Roman Catholic priests believe that they can help Jesus. They work with Jesus to help forgive people of their sins and make people sinless. Your book seems to be saying the same, making the same claim for these anointed Jehovah's Witnesses, the 144,000 co-rulers, as the Catholic Pope makes for his priests, namely that they work with Jesus to make people sinless. And I would object to that. Yes, OK, I understand. I think, uh, OK, let me let me take up those two points, uh, Robert, and yep. then uh, give me some time just to uh, do some research on it. And then yes. um, I'll drop you a text and let's have a follow-up conversation. Yes, um, when you text me, please make it clear which one of those you want to look at. I suggest we look at which yep. one topic, not go from topic to topic. Let's deal with one thing and go into great depth. And I would appreciate, as I say, um, you're giving Watchtower references for what you're saying. Yep. I don't want you to say, well, I think this or I think that. What does the Watchtower yeah. actually say? And and never voicemail me, just just text. That would, that would be great, um, Nigel. Thank you. Well, I shall do that. Look out for that text in the coming... Uh, days and we'll um, look forward to having a follow-up conversation. Okay, okay, Nigel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Take care. Take bye -bye. care. Bye.